What's going on internet? IG here again. Long time no see. For the last couple of weeks, actually for the last couple of months, I've been talking about the possibility of doing a Gen 2 video. Gen 2 explained. And now here we are with my thoughts and opinions on Gen 2 Linux. So for those who aren't familiar, Gen 2 Linux is probably one of the most organic and advanced Linux distributions out of all of the open source operating systems. It's extremely modular and customizable down to the kernel itself and all of these elements can be set up and installed the way you want to run them on the hardware that you want to run them. What does this mean? At the end of the day it means that you're going to wind up with a system that is highly tailored to your specific hardware and software needs. So much so that even a system like Arch Linux that provides bleeding edge software around a similar principle as Gen 2 is not nearly as complicated. And now this is probably the part where all the Gen 2 users are complaining that it's not actually that complicated. So I want to get a few things straight first up. Number one, I'm not going to be doing an install tutorial. Why? There are a lot of great tutorials out there on YouTube as well as the documentation itself which is very very solid. Part of the whole Gen 2 experience is learning how to install it and make it work for yourself, not relying on somebody else to do it for you. Number two, don't attempt using this system unless you've been familiar with the ecosystem of the Linux world for at least a year or two. Number three, just have fun. That's really all there is to say. So here we have a Gen 2 desktop. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, this just looks like KDE. And it is indeed the KDE Plasma desktop. 4.10.3 to be exact. But the point of the matter is that Gen 2 is the core and the setup package management system that runs whatever desktop environment you want it to. So when you go to install this distribution, you're given a base ISO with some setup tools and essentially just the packages that you need to actually start a system. Then you're gonna download a bunch of other stuff that you'll need to use to install the system and then you're gonna configure all of these manual configuration files until you have a system that works for you. Then you're going to install a display server, then you're gonna install a network map. You get the point, it's a very modular approach to installing a Linux system. What does this mean? It means you get complete and infinite control over what you install on your hard drive for your specific setup. Now, why would you bother doing this? Well, let's say you had a very specific setup, say a specific architecture or a specific purpose that you wanted your computer to be, such as maybe a Raspberry Pi or a very low voltage computer that you wanted to customize. Say you wanted to create a server with very minimal system resource usage, then Gen 2 would be a very nice option. Now I've done a fairly typical install here and installed the KDE desktop environment or the KDE Plasma desktop on top of it. It runs very well and it has most of, most of the applications that you would expect. Of course installing more applications involves using the Gen 2 portage tree. And this is where Gen 2 starts to get interesting. Now because of the fact that Gen 2 is practically set up and configured using entirely terminal tools, it's worth checking out what some of these are. First on the list we do have Portage, uh, which is the Gen 2 package manager. Now understanding how the package management works with Gen 2 is a little bit different to other operating systems, but it still uses the same core principles. The first thing to know about is the Portage tree. Now the Portage tree is a collection of eBuilds. Basically eBuilds are files that contain uh, all of the information that Portage is going to need to maintain the software. So basically it's lists of dependencies, software that you might need to install if you're going to install another piece of software. And in order to keep your database or your portage tree up to date, you need to sync it with the web servers that provide Gen 2's packages. So in order to sync with the portage tree or to update the portage tree that is on your system, you need to type emerge dash dash sync. And this will jump out to the rsync servers that you have set up in your configuration file, which we're going to look at in a minute. And it will synchronize the portage tree on your system with the portage tree on the server. This means that your database of packages will be up to date and the e-builds that contain all the information of which files to pull in will also be up to date and ready to go on your system. So when you do want to install software, it will first consult your portage tree and all of the e-builds that that contains to check what software, what packages and what source code it needs to pull down. Now, if you do want to install software and you're not exactly sure what you're looking for, then the search function of Emerge comes in. So for example, if I search for Chromium, then it will search and give me some installer options here. Then in order for me to install one, I simply say Emerge 
chromium. It'll then calculate the dependencies that I may or may not need to solve myself. And you can see here in the search results that it gives you the details of what is installed on the current portage tree that I have on my system. And then you can see the results of the dependency check was that I need to make some use changes. Now what in the world are use changes? This is where Gentoo gets interesting and I need to divert to a slightly different but relevant topic. As I mentioned before, when you're setting up your Gentoo system, a lot of the configurations that you make are gonna be done in text files. And the same can be said for when you are running and maintaining your system as well. A solid 95% of the installing process is done in a text editor, uh, especially a command prompt text editor, such as Nano or Vim. Now I prefer Nano, so that's what I use most of the time. And the use changes that were referred to in the dependency description was referring to the slash Etsy slash portage slash make dot conf file. Now what is this thing? Basically this make.conf file is the configuration file that the package manager portage will consult every single time it wants to install software. Because with Gentoo, it is a rolling release. You have options to build the packages from source, which means that every time you install software, you're pulling down source code and compiling it specifically to your system, a system that is customized inside this make.conf. So for example, you're going to customize what you want to have compiled into the program or into the software that you're installing. You're also going to give it details about your system, such as make ops, um, which is an option to tell you how many threads your computer has and therefore how many threads it is able to use when it's compiling software to make the process shorter or longer, etc. But when it comes down to the actual use line itself, you can see that there's quite a few options that you can throw in here. Essentially what a use flag does is it will tell the software to compile or add support for a certain situation in your system. For example, because I'm running KDE, I wanna have KDE support enabled in all the software that I install, as well as Qt4, Ulsa for my sound, but I don't want any uh, bloated dependencies or any dependencies that are not related to, to KDE and Qt4. So, I have negative GTK and negative no, meaning I don't wanna see those things compiled into my packages because they're only gonna bog the system down. Then of course you have more system level stuff. Then of course you have more system level stuff. Stuff that you don't generally see on the surface, but they're all backend tools that are doing jobs on your computer. So depending on what you have installed and enabled at the time, you can customize in this make.conf the use flags that will highly tailor the software, stuff that you don't generally see on the surface, but they're all backend tools that are doing jobs on your computer. So depending on what you have installed and enabled at the time, you can customize in this make.conf the use flags that will highly tailor the software to your specific setup, making it perform much better than most distributions such as Ubuntu, Linux Mint, or ones that just do the wide swing generic support approach. So for example, I have some use changes that are necessary if I want to install the Chromium browser. So if I include the use changes that it suggests and then try and repeat the Chromium install process, you can see that I'm now, now no longer having that required use package change. I am, however, having a dependency discrepancy. So in order to solve the dependency issue that I was having before, I have to update the system to packages that are more recently available so that we don't have that conflict there. Now you may tell me that that's a lot of mucking around just to install one particular piece of software. And to be honest, it's true. But then this process goes one step further to the actual kernel level when you install the system. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, essentially, when you choose to install Gentoo as a system and you have downloaded a stage three tower, which contains all of these system components that you're gonna lay down on the partition of your hard drive, you are given options to compile your own kernel and you're given a end cursor prompt based menu to enable the modules or components of the Linux kernel that you want to have enabled and ready to go. Again, you're saying, but that's a lot of messing around and it's true. But again, the results of having that tailored kernel are the same as having the tailored software. That is performance. The performance gains that you get of having your own tailored kernel specific to your hardware and your setup is infinitely times better than having a generic kernel that just supports most hardware out there. 
Now, of course, you can actually opt to install a generic kernel, and as this is set up in VirtualBox, that's what I've done here. But I have installed it on my own system prior to doing this review, tailoring my own kernel to my own system. Therefore, enabling only the drivers for the graphics cards that I need, sound cards that I personally need, Wi-Fi cards, all the way up to the system level stuff. So that I have no extraneous crap on my computer at all, and to be honest, it flies. And the performance gains that you get for spending that time customizing the distribution are amazing. Now, having said all that, the same can then be true for compiling the software. Because of the fact that you might have software that depends on certain system level components, the less components that you have enabled, and the more specifically tailored the Linux kernel is to your system, the faster Linux software is going to install, as it doesn't have to compile support for as many different things as a generic kernel. Having said all that, software compilation is a bit of a slow and boggy process. As you can see here, I am compiling the updates for the package install that I had, which was just to install the Chromium browser and this will probably keep going for about five to ten minutes. Then I'll decide to install the Chromium browser and we'll be done. So it does take quite a long time to A, install the system, if you, especially the first time around, B, install software once you have installed and configured your own graphical desktop environment, Tessera, you do have a highly customized system and a very modular system that has only the stuff that you want in there. Therefore, you know exactly what is going into your system. It is a rolling release, so you get relatively stable packages as they trickle down from upstream. And you can maintain a, com a completely open source system as both the Linux kernel and all of the software that has been installed since is compiled, installed, and configured by yours truly. And that is really the beauty and complexity surrounding the Gen 2 Linux operating system. That's why it's been such a good base for things like Chrome OS, Sabion, and other distributions. So for a specific hardware setup, this distribution is going to have all of your needs covered without a shadow of a doubt. Because you do have a fairly recent and up-to-date kernel, you are also going to have a lot of great hardware support that you can configure into the kernel yourself. However, as an everyday desktop user, I don't really recommend Gen2. It really just takes too long to install software and to keep your system running at an admirable level. As an everyday user, that has been my experience. For those who are happy to sit through all of the nuts and bolts of the Linux desktop, and indeed the Linux kernel, then you are going to see some rewards. And if you don't have to install and update software all that often, the performance gains could well outweigh the time that it takes to get it set up. The engineering behind the Gen 2 Linux system is one of the modern wonders of the world, in my opinion, and it really gives you much more appreciation for the distributions that make it easy for the new user. Of course, there are many, many elements to this system that I just do not have the time nor the scope to share, but I'm hoping that this video gives you a good idea of what the Gen 2 system is about, who it's for, and what it can do for you. So what do you like most about the Gen 2 way of doing things? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, leave suggestions for any app reviews or distro reviews you'd like me to take a look at, and after a month's sabbatical, I'm back again, so you'll be seeing videos every week. Thank you all again for your support and subscription and comments and likes and all of that fun stuff. Of course, I'll have videos coming up for Debian, Magia, Linux Mint, and I think that's about all of them. Oh yeah, maybe Lunar Beta 2 as well. We'll see what happens. Once again, like the video if you did indeed, like what you saw, and subscribe if you like this content on a regular basis, and I shall see you all in the very near future. Next week, as a matter of fact. Peace out, ladies and gentlemen. Hey man, could you turn the music down a scratch? So good. I was just waiting to see how long it would take. Yeah, no, I'm just checking audio levels now. And it's gonna be like slightly echoey in the background. Thank you. This is definitely going in the outtakes. <laughs>